Good afternoon. This is Dyke Hendrickson, and this is the podcast, Life Along the Merrimack. Each week, we talk about the history and the health of the Merrimack River. And we also talk about Plum Island. So one thing we're going to talk about today is some of the women who have made history as it relates to the Merrimack River and to Plum Island. Now, I believe next month, March, is history, Women's History Month. But I'm getting started a little early, and we may repeat this. Women have, of course, in past centuries, had a limited role in a lot of elements of the river. For instance, Newburyport was a great shipbuilding community, but women did not work building the ships. Now, of course, they had families. They <clears throat> held up the community and churches and social life. But there isn't too much information about women in the professions or the trades way back when. But several women really have helped in recent years with the Merrimack River and cleaning up the river. And I think we've talked about it in the past that uh, the Merrimack sometimes is getting dirtier, not cleaner. And several women elected officials here on the North Shore had been very valuable in helping keeping the river clean, and we'll talk about them. Also, there were uh, women who were involved in um, making the river cleaner for drinking water, and also um, helping Plum Island in its uh, attempts during the 30s and 40s to become a wildlife refuge. Now, in the 30s and 40s, it was before what we had an environmental movement. But there were many people who loved to come to Plum Island and see the birds. And at the same time, there were many hunters on the North Shore and throughout the East, actually, who loved to come to Plum Island and shoot birds. So some wanted to shoot them with rifles, some wanted to shoot them with cameras. But a woman from that day, Annie Brown, was very important in saving uh, the black duck and others. So. <laughs> we're going to have a, a move through history, and we're going to talk about some of the women who have really uh, been helpful. This is a wonderful photo. If you're, look, if you're listening on the radio rather than watching, this is a wonderful uh, aerial shot of the opening of the Merrimack River to the Atlantic, and you can see the entirety of Plum Island. Now, the way I view things these days, the Merrimack River also includes Plum Island. One of the reasons is, you know, I think we know that it flows by Plum Island and that's a natural thing. Uh, also, I recently wrote a book titled Plum Island, A Vulnerable Gem. That'll be out in June. <laughs> but I have Plum Island on the mind. And here as you're looking at this in July, this is a wonderful shot. Um, to the lower left, you can actually see some of the marsh, and then of the upper right, there's quite a bit of marsh. This is the largest marsh in New England and is really essential for bird life, for fish life, for just the ecology of the region. So this photo comes from a fellow who lives on Plum Island. His name is Steve Atherton, and he, one of his avocations is taking aerial photos. And I'm glad he does, because I have used about 10 of them in my upcoming book. But here you can see Plum Island and the river and see just how beautiful it was. And in the old days, many people came to, um, came to the river. The Native Americans came in the summer. They swam. They had seafood um, pretty well available. There was a lot of fish. There were lobsters available. Uh, later. You know, there were small cottages, say, in the 19th century. And then when, ro when roads and cars came in the earliest 20th century, more cottages were built. But I think you can see how beautiful here the river is. Now, one of the first, um, first women who is well known in this region for her work on the river um, was Hannah Dustin. And you can see this 
wonderful statue of Hannah Dustin. This is in Haverhill. This is, you know, it's an unusual story. Um, this woman is actually being lionized for saving one of her own children and a friend, but in doing so, she slayed about 10 Native Americans. This was about in 1697. This is a long time ago. But the story goes that um, she was living in the Haverhill area with her family. She had about six or seven children. Native Americans came um, one day and kidnapped herself, uh, one of her baby, and she had a friend uh, with her, I think, as well as a 10-year-old son. So the Native Americans were taking her upriver towards the New Hampshire part of the Merrimack. And the story goes that one night, uh, just after they had crossed into New Hampshire towards the native tribal lands where the uh, Native Americans were living, she woke up, got a hatchet, and hatcheted about 10 Native Americans who were keeping them cap captive. Now, I suppose we can look at it in both ways nowadays, since Native Americans are appreciated. Um, at the time, she was considered a hero. After all, she saved her baby, she saved her friend. She was able to get into canoe and get back to the Haverhill area. And she, Hannah Dustin, you can see actually the hatchet in her hand has been lionized since then. Now this is supposedly the first statue of a woman in New England. <laughs> Strange that it should be the result of slaying about a dozen Native Americans, but there it is, Hannah Dustin, um, you know, was a real early, early hero of the area, saved her children, saved other people, and so she became very well known. Now, during the 18th and 19th centuries, Newburyport was a very significant shipbuilding community, and one reason was the river itself. It was one of the few towns on the North Shore that had a very long river that went into timber country. And by that, I mean, the Merrimack is 117 miles long. It goes deep into New Hampshire and uh, much, many logs could come down. And so the Newburyport, and I'm including ha Amesbury and Salisbury and other places, had a steady flow of timber, which other towns like Essex and Salem, uh, even Portsmouth, did not have that 117 miles going into the forest. So Newburyport was a very um, prosperous in that sense. So they had lumber coming down. And even after the mills came along, and I should point out that this is a 200th anniversary of the arrival of the mills on the Merrimack, 1822, uh, the first uh, textile mill was built in Lowell. Um, that it's been two centuries. And even at the time in Lowell, when they built locks, they built dams to hold the water so that there could be hydropower. There were many um, logs would still come down. They made sure that the logs could get to Newburyport. And the reason I use this, the women, as we say, were not in the trades, uh, but you can see them in the foreground here. It was a big day when a ship was built and look how large these ships were. I mean, it dwarfs the horse on the right. Uh, to, for radio listeners, we're looking at a 300 foot vessel, probably 400 tons. It does not have its uh, masts on yet, but this was a foremaster. They would put that on later. But you can see the women in the foreground who had come down for the big celebration. They were well-dressed, they had hats, they came in carriages. I think you can see several carriages there. And this is a wonderful photo. And I use it because, you know, it's a big day for the women as well as for the workers. This was from 1892. This was one of the last tall ships built in Newburyport. And one of the reasons that was <clears throat> is the Merrimack River is very shallow. It draws 12 to 16 feet. And if you didn't use high tide for such a vessel as this, you couldn't get it out of the harbor. But then as iron and steel vessels came along, they were heavier than wood and they drew more water. And so with such a shallow river, this was not a good place to be building heavy iron ships. 
Now, we've just heard last week, John McCone, who was with the Merrimack River Watershed Council, spoke on the show, and he talked about money has been found to dredge the opening of the Merrimack River this summer. And that is probably good news. There's a lot of boaters and a lot of people who use the river who feel that it's very shallow even today. And if they don't come through at high tide, they have a hard time. But I love this photo, an 1892 photo, and um, it shows the many women in the community who came down for the uh, launching of a vessel. This is Ellen Swallow Richards, and she was a real hero of the Merrimack River. She was from the Cambridge area, went to school, was very smart, and in about 1883 graduated from MIT. She was the first woman graduate of MIT. And she actually did enough uh, classwork and coursework to earn an advanced degree. But in those days, they did not give advanced degrees to women. She was probably lucky to get out with a BA. But she was very, uh, very smart in the areas of chemistry and water purification. And so in about 1890 or so, um, a lot of youngsters and families along the river in the Lawrence area and Lowell area um, were falling ill to typhoid. And typhoid can kill, and it did kill a number of youngsters in the Lawrence area. Now at this time, Lawrence did have purified water, purified drinking water. But clearly, well, actually I shouldn't say clearly, it was not being uh, scientifically treated in an adequate way. And this is what was causing the typhoid. Ellen Swallow Richards came along and was one of a team appointed by the state governor to look into the river water of the Merrimack and find out, you know, is this causing typhoid? Now she was not the only one and she wasn't even the chair of this committee. There were six or seven scientists brought along and uh, she was instrumental, however, in uh, bringing her ideas forth and she and others created a new way of purifying drinking water. And it turned out to be very successful. Typhoid uh, was wiped out essentially, and it was used in Lowell and in Haverhill, and then it spread to other parts of the country. So she was a leader in coming up with a reason and to make the water cleaner, and she was successful in her science. Now, it should be remembered that in those days, the poor families lived next to the river. The wealthy families lived away from the river. They probably knew it was impure and they had large houses in their own wells, but the poor people lived near the river. Nowadays, of course, you know, wealthy people want the view. In those days, the poor people lived near the river. That, that was a squalid areas in many cases and so, um, it was, they got the water straight from the river and they got a number of maladies, including typhoid. And Ellen Swallow Richards was one of the women, or one of the people, the only woman on the team that found this breakthrough. And I love her maiden name, Ellen Swallow. I mean, if you're gonna go into the drinking water field, the name of Swallow is certainly appropriate. She married Professor Richards and became Ellen Swallow Richards. But this was really, a hero of clean water. Now, I recently wrote a book titled Merrimack, the Resilient River, which talks about the fact that the Merrimack has gone through a lot of changes and a lot of improvements over the years, because in the old days, the effluent and the, the mills and the sewage from the town would go directly into the river. Well, we still have a nice river. But it surprised me to hear, now this is 2022, we're talking, that still 500,000 people in the Merrimack Valley still get their drinking water from the Merrimack River. Now, it has been purified as we've just discussed, but um, it just is another reason why folks along the river and the North Shore have to be insistent on a clean river that involves effluent from the mills and from the uh, sewage treatment plants, but it also, goes into an examination of some of the new factories 
along the river up in southern New Hampshire and ascertaining what kind of chemicals um, are they using and when they put them through um, their sewage treatment plants, are they really being cleaned up? Because some chemicals last for decades, if not centuries. And so that is an ongoing probe, I would mention, but uh, we still have to keep the river clean. So this is Life Along the Merrimack. I'm Dyke Hendrickson, the host. This is 96.3 FM radio, channel nine on cable TV, and it is archived on YouTube. Here is you know, one of the great um, pioneers of clean water and wildlife. Um, she wrote the book, Silent Spring, uh, and her name is Rachel Carson. She came, she was um, actually an employee, a writer and a scientist for the um, Federal Fish and Game way back in the 30s and 40s. And she was a scientist as well. She went to Johns Hopkins and then studied thereafter. And one was one of the first people, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> who would write about the clean water and the problems with creating clean water. Here she is shown uh, on the Atlantic looking at some specimens. And in her book, A Silent Spring, she wrote about the fact that DDT, the chemical, was doing great damage to the birds in this area and all areas because DDT was going through the body of these females and males and it resulted in the, the birds having very thin shells when they laid their eggs and the shells would break and the fledglings would die. So she was one of the first ones who used her knowledge and she wrote the book Silent Spring talking about the need um, to harness DDT and the need to pay a great attention to bird life. Now she actually has a close connection to Newburyport. In 1947, she came here and she uh, was doing a study for fish and game and she was studying um, black ducks. Now, as I mentioned earlier, black ducks were a coveted um, species in terms of they're beautiful and they're tasty. And the hunters love to come to Newburyport and to what is now the wildlife refuge and hunt ducks. But a lot of people, um, as today, wanted to just see the ducks and be bird watchers. And she wrote a paper in 1947, which essentially said, we can do both. If we just separate a part of Plum Island um, for, as a refuge, the black ducks can stay there and multiply. The hunters can also do their hunting nearby in Raleigh or other parts of the marsh. And so that's what we have today. Hunting is still permissible in the marsh and in parts of Plum Island. And so she was very successful in pointing out the problem. At that time, black ducks were um, an endangered species, uh, although I'm not sure the term existed at that time. But because they stopped shooting them, and started watching them. The black duck made a good return and there's plenty of there now. And so she was a real hero. Unfortunately, as a human thing, um, she died in 1964 or thereabouts of cancer. And it's very poignant to think that in 1962, after Silent Spring came out, a lot of people, a lot of industries really criticized her they're paid to do so, I should point out. DuPont and others who made DDT and were saying her um, science is faulty. Um, she doesn't know what she's talking about, but she did. And she had to fight these huge corporations. She testified in Congress numerous times. And then uh, she went on and became a real hero of the movement. And here's Annie Brown. She was a, from Stoneham. She was a wealthy a woman in about 1929, she gave much of her um, largesse, her, uh, her financial estate to what is now the Audubon Society. And so with that money, $100,000 and other funds, a lot of Plum Island was taken over by the Audubon Society first. And then shortly thereafter, 
uh, it became the um, Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, but it's about 4,700 acres. It has about 200,000 200, people come each year to look at birds. But Annie Brown, a bird watcher from Stoneham, is a real hero because she set money aside and we have Plum Island Refuge as a result. Here are two lively spirits on the Merrimack River. That's Diana DiZoglio in the bow, Jim Kelkors in the stern. He is a state rep from Amesbury, Salisbury, in Newburyport. <clears throat> She's a state senator. They went down the river a couple of years ago in an effort to bring attention to the river and um, probably to have a good time as well. But, and here is a wonderful photo. They are having a good time. Um, this is another shot of Senator Zoglio. She has been a leader in getting uh, legislation to help clean up the Merrimack to get money for it. Her efforts resulted in the Merrimack uh, River District Commission uh, through which studies can be made. And so she has been a real a leader. She's from Methuen. And she's running, incidentally, she's not going to be state senator anymore this November. She's running for state auditor, which is a wonderful job. It pays $186,000 a year. You get a car, a driver, and a nice office. But she has done a wonderful job with the river and uh, has been a credit in this area. Lori Trahan is um, the congresswoman from the Lowell area. Uh, she, as well, has been doing much for the river. There is a number many millions of dollars are out there. Um, and she is a Congresswoman who's trying to get money um, for sewage treatment plants. Um, one problem with the big treatment plants, Havel, Lawrence, Lowell, Manchester, is that when there's a heavy rain, uh, the rainwater goes into the sewage treatment plant along with the effluent. And if it, if it becomes too much rainwater, they have to let everything go. So that means millions of gallons of effluent sewage, raw sewage, goes into the Merrimack. So she is trying to get money, so federal money, so they can improve the sewage treatment plants. Mayor Donna Holliday has done, uh, former Mayor Donna Holliday has done a lot for the Merrimack River. She left office recently, but she was one of the first ones to say, uh, in many meetings of different groups, to say, look, we're at the end of the line. You know, Amesbury, Newburyport, Salisbury, um, we get, we're getting all the sewage from upriver. Let's work on getting money and improve the sewage treatment plants. And so she um, was instrumental in that. She spoke publicly. I heard her, I was with the Daily News for about five years, 2012 to 2017. And I heard her speak many times. She really is a supporter of the river. She also did a good thing while she was mayor, you may remember that uh, in the winter of 2015 or so, um, a lot the sewage treatment uh, apparatus did not work on Plum Island. Uh, many people had backup. This, um, it, it froze. It shouldn't have froze, but it did. The engineering company involved made a big mistake. They chose a, you know, a, an application that had never been tried this far north. It froze. So. Drinking water was hard to get, but also it was hard to pump the sewage back and forth. But she knows her stuff. And one thing she did is file suit against the engineering company and the construction company and said, you did not do a good job. We want you know several million dollars back because we have had to pay a great deal of money to redo what you did. So I would give her a great deal of credit for that. She knows her stuff. She knows her law. She was trained as a lawyer. So she got several million dollars back for the communities of Newbury and Newburyport. So Donna Holiday earns kudos in several areas. This, this uh, photo does not relate to the river necessarily, except I love the photo. And Newburyport is on the river, so here we are. Uh, this is a picture of the um, female high school in Newburyport. It was created in 1844. It lasted until 1886 or so, 1866 or so. And it was the first girls' high school in the country with taxpayer money. 
run by taxpayer money. Now, there are many schools for girls, you know, for music, for horseback riding, for reading, for anything, but those were private or through institutions. Newburyport reportedly had the first female girls high school from taxpayer money. So that's a real credit. But this is from about 1850 or so. Um, the, uh, the school, which is on Washington Street um, in, in downtown Newburyport is no longer there. It closed in about 1866 when they decided to consolidate with other schools and it burnt several years later. But this is one of my favorite photos. All the, the I don't say all the girls, but you know, the girls were dressed, some had hats, certainly the teachers did. They're outside the building on Washington Street. And um, it's one of my favorite photos in the history of Newburyport. Here is um, a book that I wrote, um, Merrimack the Resilient River, an illustrated profile, the most historic river in New England. And a lot of historic things did happen here. Newburyport is the birthplace of the Coast Guard, it is the birthplace of the mill system with hydropower. It was the start of clean water, as we've discussed, on the Merrimack clean water that wiped out um, uh, typhoid and other illnesses. And in recent years, it has been the center of, you know, a lot of recreation. Uh, there are 1,500 vessels that are uh, moored each year in the Merrimack River. And people from all over, you know, the North Shore of Massachusetts, from New Hampshire, and many other places um, love to come to Newburyport. And that's in part because in recent years, the water has gotten cleaner. Senator Ed Muskie of Maine in 1972 was instrumental in passing the Clean Water Act. And like the Merrimack, but similar to the Penobscot, the Kennebec, the Connecticut River, all rivers and lakes, and even the ocean have benefited from Ed Muskie. And the cover shows um, New Hampshire, Franklin, New Hampshire, um, which looks, I, I took that picture a year or two ago, and that looks quite a bit like it must have looked two or 300 years ago, because the upper part of the Merrimack is, is you know, untouched by houses, and it's flowing madly along the white water, and it's a fun place to canoe or kayak. And the lower end is Newburyport on the right, Salisbury Beach on the left, and you can see, you know, what a interesting spot it is. So that's mostly what we're talking about today. We talked about a half dozen women of the Merrimack River. Um, they did a lot in different ways. <clears throat> they were scientists. Um, they were donors. They were political figures. And with Women's History Month coming up in March, I just wanted to get it on the record. I hope to do more research, find more women who have done good things, and we can talk about that another time. This is Life Along the Merrimack. It's a podcast. I'm Dyke Hendrickson. We meet once a week, and sometimes these are repeated. Uh, it's on radio and television, 96.3 FM, Joppa Radio, um, Channel 9, Cable TV, and it is archived on YouTube. So we'll be back again next week. We talked about women today. We always talk about the health and history of the Merrimack River and Plum Island. And we will see you again next week. Thank you for being with us.